How is it going, everybody? My name is DeMarco, and we have a loaded interview from former Bethesda Senior Design Director, Bruce Nesmith. Now, if you don't know who that is, that's totally okay. I don't blame you. He is a very important person at Bethesda, though. We're going to go into exactly his backstory, why you should care, why he's important, and why it's a shame in lieu of a lot of the other recent departures that we've been seeing but there's a lot that goes into this interview from the company culture shifting to fallout 76 and that game's launch to starfield and even some small teases about the elder scrolls 6 and todd howard's pivotal role at bethesda even though we like to meme and dunk on him and make jokes about the things he says and does he really is an important figure at the company and all of this gets explained we're going to take out the highlights for you but if you are interested i'll leave a link to the full interview by min max which it was a great one highly recommend you check it out down in the description below but if you like rpgs if you like bethesda games consider sticking around subscribing look forward to seeing what you guys have to say first who the hell is Bruce Nesmith? Bruce is a very important person, even though you might not have heard his name come up too many times, but he's worked at Bethesda since the 90s. He worked on Elder Scrolls Daggerfall, he took a bit of a hiatus, but he came back to work on Oblivion, Fallout 3, he was the senior or the lead designer on Skyrim, and he was a senior design director for Starfield before he retired during that game's development shortly after the Microsoft acquisition. And that story of people leaving Bethesda is becoming an increasingly familiar one, as unfortunate as it is. And that plays partially into some of the change in company culture that we've been witnessing over the past couple years. Here, it gets explained in pretty graphic detail. Major players, Pete Hines retiring and Bruce Nesmith retiring, he actually explained how the Microsoft acquisition expedited his retirement a bit sooner, put it a couple years earlier. You have people leaving like Jeff Gardner who was pivotal to turning Fallout 76 around from the way that it launched. He now formed his own studio in the form of Something Wicked Games, which is working on a title called Weird Song. I definitely want to talk more about that on this channel so keep an eye out there's also will shen who is becoming a pretty important name within bethesda see after the release of fallout 4's far harbor which he was primarily in charge of and he actually left to go reunite with jeff gardner at something wicked and so this studio that once prided itself on having all of this retention at the company has since started becoming more of what the industry norm is where people do come and go they seek advancement opportunities they want to keep growing in their positions there, there was a core group of oh man it was probably closing in on a hundred people that were really pivotal to what created the uh the core Bethesda crowd, as I like to call them. Bethesda at that point in time had the uh, the wonderful attribute of being a place that nobody wanted to leave. We kept getting to work with the same people and we really got to know each other and be able to adapt to each other's strengths and weaknesses. And uh, it, it made for a wonderful time to create games. For Bethesda's case, it's a bit more interesting where the studio on Skyrim was just around 100 people and now on Starfield, it grew upwards of 400 across multiple different studios in Montreal, in Maryland, in Austin, in Dallas, and all these teams trying to communicate and work together is not the same as that 100 core person team with Todd Howard directly at the center. I think it's just a, a natural course of team and corporate development. Uh, it was, that kind of stability is not really sustainable, unfortunately, which is odd to say when you're using stable and sustainability in the same sentence. But in order to continue to grow as a studio, there had to be changes and not everybody was going to be on board with the changes and the changes weren't necessarily something that was going to be easy to institute. It's been discussed both here on this channel and on other channels about how the studios growing is not always the best thing for the games. There's this interesting paradox that does take place where the bigger a studio gets, the lower quality the games seem to come out as. And I do think a large part of that is because you lose some of this cohesion and some of this full singular vision that absolutely everybody is aligned on to make a stellar product within the confines that you have whether it's budget whether it's time or a myriad of other issues that you might run into during game development it's gonna be a weird spot for you to be in to have been at the studio for so long and as higher ups are pushing for what more living games bigger games and you're just oh, yeah. looking around saying 
Uh, we've had a core group here for a long time. They've made you a lot of money. How about you let us do what we want to do here and stay small? Or is it natural that everybody wants to grow? Well, and I'd, I'd have to thank Todd Howard in a big way for that. Um, Todd became the single source communicator to management. But the dilution of Bethesda's company culture extends a bit further as Bruce explains during this interview that even Todd Howard, who still is at the center of everything going on for a lot of these decisions, is no longer as accessible as he once was as he's bouncing between these multiple different studios. You didn't get to uh, interact with Todd as much anymore. Hmm. And I've been blessed with the ability to pretty much walk into his office anytime I needed to and be able to have conversations with him. But when you're running six different studios and you've got a dozen projects, although usually only one really big one, going on at a time, you know, he just, he just, he's only one man. He doesn't have the face time to be able to, to do that anymore, so. Bruce admits that all decisions historically and even still go through Todd Howard, not because he's there forced to. In fact, he even openly says that Todd wouldn't want to be recognized as that being his role. He wants to have a little bit of humility, but people do it voluntarily because they seek his input. Because Todd Howard has established such a strong track record, both with game development and just in the industry as a whole. I mean, he's one of the few developers, if not the only developer, that's officially in the Entertainment Hall of Fame, or one of them. The Interactive Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. I had to look that one up, but... He's a Hall of Fame member. It's a big deal. And so what does that look like when there's one person at the center of this entire company that can no longer perform the job that he once did because of the scope and scale? When you can't get in touch with the person who has been left to ultimately make the final say on a lot of design decisions in the game. But I think when you've got somebody who is at the creative center and heart of a studio, there's going to be a limit to the size you can grow to. Mm -hmm. And Bethesda, you know, I don't know this for a fact, but I think Bethesda probably outgrew that with the ability to have him at the creative center. He would have had to give up more creative control than he was willing to for other projects in order to uh, allow the company to be larger and still maintain that creative center on, on the things he cared the most about. Todd Howard, as much as we like to meme on him, he's very important for Bethesda. Bruce openly says that if Todd Howard just vanished one day, if he was no longer there, there's no one person that would be able to fill his role at Bethesda, that there would be a vacuum that's left behind. That Todd had an attribute that none of the rest of us did. He was always able to put himself into the seat of your everyday player to a far better extent than the rest of the design team hmm. or the rest of the development team. Not only just from making decisions and being able to design games in a way that, re that players respond well to, but also just from that corporate oversight. If Todd were to leave the studio, is there someone there that would have that level of authority especially now that Microsoft is technically the one that's calling the shots. We've seen how successful some smaller projects can be. You look at something like Hi-Fi Rush that is a phenomenal title. If you do like rhythm games, obviously you need to have some interest in that. Or something like Grounded or Pentiment that came from Obsidian Entertainment, two smaller projects that really released to a lot of critical success. These studios, when they are left to their own devices and they're enabled to pursue some of the creative decisions that they wanna make, they often do very well. Not always, there's definitely some flops along the lines. We've heard stories about how, for example, Anthem was mostly left to Bioware to develop and EA actually had to step in and clean things up for them despite what everybody Thought. Do you remember that one? That one was an interesting time. There's always going to be this element of gut instinct when it comes to game development that you need to trust your gut on something. Anytime you do any type of creative endeavor, there's that element that's going to be present. And Fallout 76 is actually an instance where they fell on their own humorance. Pride cometh before the fall. And it certainly hit with Fallout 76 after multiple back to back to back game of the year winners they thought they could just sort of get away with a lot more and they bit off more than they could chew with Fallout 76 and that ultimately hurt them. It, I would say, more or less 
permanently changed a lot of players perspectives as to what Bethesda can do and as to how we look at Bethesda games going forward including Starfield and the Elder Scrolls 6 even if you're fully enthusiastic about Elder Scrolls 6 there's that little nugget I'm sure that's in your brain that's like well Bethesda did do this and it never was that way before it's an interesting perspective to look into how Fallout 76 in this regard might have actually been a really healthy sort of smack in the face for Bethesda to understand that they couldn't get away with everything. It was sort of building to this point that we would have hit eventually in some way. If you think about it, it was more of an inevitability and it's good that we had that. It's weird to think about it that way, but there you go. To a certain extent, our own hubris caught up with us. You know, we had had so many, you know, not just successes, but literal game of the years, like yeah. industry-wide accepted game of the years. You know, we started to talk ourselves into the fact of, you know, we were infallible. You know, that we there was nothing we couldn't do. And clearly that's wrong. Switching topics a little bit, I do want to touch on another small tidbit that got addressed during this interview. A lot of people have criticisms about Starfield, many of them completely fair and I'm open to admitting that I have my own problems with the game and one is explicitly called out here but it's an interesting perspective the way that it was phrased and I want you to take a listen to this for yourself. Never misunderstand this in every game studio on the face of this planet they know the choices they're making and they know the things that are not going to be in there they know what the players are going to moan about. It's been said by better people than I that Game studios know 90% of the bugs that they ship with. They're just backed into a corner. Yeah. And the same is true with features. And I think players have really gravitated to the build your own ship, for example, which makes me personally happy because I worked really hard on that. That was probably a good choice to say, well, the exploration could take a little bit of a hit so that we can apply that same uh, effort to making ship construction really cool. Now at points during this interview, it's mentioned how Todd is at the center of creative decisions and that it needs to go through him or it does go through him at any given point. Yet I find it really interesting that more of the focus was put on the shipbuilding versus the exploration, which Bethesda should, I would assume, be aware of how massive of a part of their games is it's also interesting that they know this is something that players would quote moan about and complain about however they still decided to go through with it anyway part of that i do fully understand is pushing some of these new systems and i've enjoyed the shipbuilding mechanic from what i've played and i've seen some really really damn cool designs but it does bring into play why a lot of people might be concerned about Bethesda's future, about the Elder Scrolls 6, because Bethesda is prioritizing some of these new things instead of what worked really, really well, and that is building these fun worlds to explore, while Starfields is significantly less so. Openly saying, exploration took a hit. Now, to set everybody's minds at ease, because I know people are going to start freaking out and saying, well, Elder Scrolls 6 is going to suck, so I didn't like Starfield, and I have no hope for the next Elder Scrolls game, and I get why a lot of people might be on that boat, and I can appreciate and respect your skepticism. I think that's actually healthy, as long as it's done in a healthy way. I understand that's a little bit of a weird way to say it. But I will say I do believe that Elder Scrolls 6 is going to be the true test for what Bethesda is this generation. What Bethesda going forward is like, obviously, depending on what happens with Todd Howard. Is he going to retire? How long is he going to stay at the company? That's a bit in the air. Maybe he's just seeing a lot of his colleagues move on to new projects and he sort of says, you know what? Maybe it's my time as well. We don't know what's going to happen on that front, but at the very least for The Elder Scrolls 6, I would advise many of you to try to hold expectations a little bit in check, but also let yourself be excited for it and be optimistic. Elder Scrolls is a familiar world. Bethesda does not need to build it from the ground up, which presents an entire host of challenges. It's also not trying to make a hundred different star systems with a thousand different planets. You're back to one single region, maybe at most two regions if we want to speculate about it, but I actually I, I'm starting to lean more towards one, if I'm being honest. 
I'm sure in a week I'll be flip-flopping back to two continents. I don't, I don't know. It's all a guess at this point. But to round out this discussion, the other aspect of it that needs to be touched on as well is simply Elder Scrolls has more of an established formula. I think the 1000 planets, the procedural generation, and the way it was used for Starfield does help to provide Starfield with a unique identity. I've talked about this in the past where I genuinely do believe Bethesda needs to start approaching each of these franchises as very different projects for very different audiences. It should no longer be we're building a Bethesda game, whether it's Fallout or Starfield or Elder Scrolls. The focus should now be we are building an Elder Scrolls game for Elder Scrolls fan, and that has a very particular identity. And of course, there's going to be overlap because they're going to have the same Bethesda's general philosophies of how they build games, but they feel like they're own in their own little pocket of sorts. Now, lastly, while we're on the subject of Elder Scrolls, there were some small Elder Scrolls teases that I'm excited to jump into, and I think we could actually have an extended discussion about this sometime or some of these elements sometime in the future. However, two things were explicitly mentioned. First and foremost was the leveling up system. A core pillar of the Elder Scrolls identity over the past several years was if you use a skill, it levels up. That identity carried a little bit more into Starfield as well, and they made this interesting hybrid system that I quite appreciated. Do wish Elder Scrolls would go a little bit more hardcore with the D&D side of things where you're putting in points, lean back into oblivion with the different attributes that you level up, but that's just me. Additionally, the magic system in Skyrim was something that both has its own strengths and weaknesses, but one thing is it's very different from what was done in Oblivion. And I think overall, there were a lot of improvements. For example, being able to cast dual casting for strong spells was a cool thing, especially when you first did it. I love to see it. And Bruce actually explains how that was his idea. The whole magic system for Skyrim, right. I persuaded Todd to let me throw out the baby and the bathwater and restart it from scratch. And he trusted me enough to do that. There will probably still be traces of that in six. Yeah. Um, the whole, uh, you do it to get better at it. Uh, while that was not my unique idea, I had a large hand in that. That's absolutely going to continue. Uh, he was trusted to completely redo the magic system, and what we saw in Skyrim came from Bruce himself. So, great idea, pretty good improvement. However, there are some changes that I would still like to continue to see. For example, the return of touch spells. If I touch someone, I want to be able to have advantages and disadvantages to that. For example, in Oblivion, those spells were generally cheaper to cast. However, naturally you need to get right up next to your opponent, which puts you in range of getting hurt. Additionally, if you were wielding a sword and a shield, but you could still cast magical spells, that's just not a possibility in Skyrim. And I really think that kind of takes back from some of the playthroughs that you have to manually shift between them and have your hotkeys ready or go through the favorites menu to select stuff. It's a lot more clunky. Let me do both at the same time. He does admit that, of course, Elder Scrolls 6 is still very early in development, out of pre-production, as we now know, but early development. And so things can change, but at least his perspective is that was there to stay, unless there's some radically new opinions and thoughts about how it can be done better. So definitely a lot going on, and Bethesda is changing definitively. The last video I released was titled The End of Bethesda's Dark Ages, and I know, dramatic title, but ultimately just talking about how Bethesda went from this phase of these live service monetization heavy games in all of their titles, not just Bethesda Game Studios, and now it seems like they have a lot more creative freedom to go in the directions they want to go. They have the support of Microsoft, which can be a good thing. We still have to wait and see how that exactly plays out, but ultimately, they're on a good path. And I did cite how Starfield going back to single player, even though it did not get everything right, and we all know that's the case, it was a step in the right direction. And again, as I said before, I think Elder Scrolls 6 will be a real test for the current state of Bethesda. But we also have to acknowledge, and I'm fully cognizant of the fact that Bethesda is a different studio. Bethesda Game Studios in particular is different than it once was. There's changes, there's new people, there's old people leaving, new people coming in. That's going to lead to some differences. And of course, the scale and the size of the team while still trying to seemingly hold on to that core central creative person is not necessarily a sustainable practice. 
We'll see how that does play out. It's a different studio, but I am optimistic and I'm looking forward to seeing what the Elder Scrolls 6 in particular has in store for all of us. Let me know if you agree or disagree with that down in the comment section below. Thank you all so much for watching and as always, I hope to see you all next time. So long, everybody.